I'd like to welcome everybody to this session host, hosted by the History of Economic Society. The title of the session is Macro Agent Base versus DSGE Modeling, a short history of two competing approaches to macroeconomics. We'll have three papers today um, and sort of three discussants. The individual who are, have done the paper will also be discussants of one of the other papers. Um, I've asked each of the presenters to sort of stay within 20 minutes in their presentation and as their discussants to stay within, so within 10 minutes. The hope is to make sure we leave times for questions and answers. So those participants who have questions, put them into Q&A and after we do the presentations, sort of we'll I'll let, let people an answer their various questions. So you can put them in, you can address the questions to specific individuals or just everybody. We'll handle that, that'll be at the end, probably after about an hour to an hour and a half um, as the initial ones go. We've changed the order slightly from the way it was in, in the outline, but you know, so we're going to start with Domenico Delgatti, who will talk about agent-based macroeconomics and syncretic view. Um, and then Muriel <laughs> Legrand will sort of be the discussant for that. So we'll go to Domenico, Domenico now, take over. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me share the screen. I hope that uh, you can see it well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So thanks a lot for inviting me to present this paper. It's a pleasure and a honor. Uh, and uh, I'm doing the following essentially. Uh, I'm starting with, uh, this one. Uh, with the motivation, what they're trying to do in a short span of 20 minutes or so, at least to give the flavor of the argument and try to convince you and the skeptics more generally uh, that the macroeconomic agent-based models are appropriate and adequate tools to study the macroeconomy, especially in complex times uh, such that uh, the ones that we are living in. Uh, moreover, I want to convince the skeptics that uh, these models are not based on uh, uh, unsound foundations. They retain some ideas also of uh, the um, canonical macroeconomics. Uh, of course, when this canonical macroeconomics is peppered with enough frictions to be appealing to the agent-based modeler. Uh, finally, uh, I will uh, show you an example of an attempted uh, hybridization between uh, a somewhat standard uh, macroeconomic model and agent-based model. Uh, let me start from uh, uh, the outline. Uh, I will go very briefly into how a macro region based model is uh, built. I will discuss uh, uh, some issues pertaining to the micro foundations of these models. And finally, I will uh, show you very rapidly the building blocks of this hybrid macro region based model. I have uh, time constraint, so I will be very uh, brief and just touch upon uh, this issue very uh, rapidly. Uh, let me start from uh, what is a macro region based model. It's a model of the macroeconomy where the macroeconomy is conceived as a complex adaptive system. Uh, these are keywords that somehow represent uh, an economy as a multitude of heterogeneous agents that can be different from uh, along different profiles that uh, uh, interact with each other in the environment of a number of markets. Uh, these models can generate uh, aggregate variables, aggregate time series by uh, uh, summing across individual quantities. So you start with uh, individuals and then you go from the individual to the aggregate through simple summation. And you can do this because uh, you are free from the uh, problem of aggregation in macro because you are actually um, uh, generating individual behavior through computer simulation. Uh, let me uh, start with two very uh, interesting quotations. Uh, one is from uh, Paul Gurinshas. Uh, it's a paper on COVID-19, a short uh, public policy paper. Uh, 
Gurinshas is certainly not uh, a member of the agent-based community. Uh, it says the following, modern economy is a complex web of interconnected parties, employees, firms, suppliers, consumers, banks, and financial intermediaries. Everyone is someone else's employee, customer, lender. A sudden stop, such as COVID-19, can easily trigger a cascading chain of events, fueled by individually rational but collectively catastrophic decisions. I couldn't describe better a complex adaptive system. Uh, the way in which um, agent-based models uh, tackle the issue of the, the, the challenge of uh, uh, modeling a complex economy is uh, resting on the shoulder of giants. Let me give you a, a quotation from a 1959 paper by Herbert Simon. The very complexity that has made the theory of the decision-making process essential has made its construction exceedingly difficult. It seems almost utopian to suppose that we could put together a model of adaptive man that would compare in completeness with a simple model of classical economic man. The modern digital computer, remember it's 1959, has changed the situation radically. It provides us with a tool of research whose power is commensurate with the complexity of the phenomena we seek to understand. As economics finds it more and more necessary to understand and explain this equilibrium as well as equilibrium, we find it an increasing use for this new tool and for communication with the sister sciences of psychology and sociology. Uh, let me now go into uh, how a model uh, of the macroeconomy, an agent-based model of macroeconomy is built. There is a starting point. It's a simple a population of heterogeneous agents. It can be household firms, banks, and the heterogeneity can come from different sources. Then you have to write uh, behavioral rules. So theory is an important part of the story. You don't rush to the computer. Uh, for instance, you have to write uh, uh, behavioral rules for demand and supply of goods, for labor, for credit, and so on and so forth. Codification is simply a way of translating these rules into code lines. This is the uh, third point or step. Then it comes a long stage of uh, um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, modeling the agent-based uh, framework. We need to validate the model by, first of all, calibrating the parameters and estimating them. The original macro agent-based model was simply calibrated. Now we are actually entering a stage in which we can, we can also estimate uh, uh, parameters, which has been a big leap forward. Then you have to run simulation. These models are not uh, uh, solvable analytically. Uh, from this point of view, there is a wide range of non-solvable, analytically speaking, macroeconomic models, not only agent-based models. So you need uh, uh, computers and you need new simulations. Then you analyze the emerging properties of the simulated data uh, that are generally different from the properties of individual um, uh, time series. And then you generate aggregate variables from the motor map, as I said. Finally, you have to compare the properties of uh, these artificial macroeconomic time series with the stylized fats, meaning volatility and correlation of macro variables out there in the, in the Lebensfeld. Uh, how many macro agent based models are out there? Many, indeed. There is a network, matter of factly, uh, of macro agent based researchers that are based predominantly in Europe, but also in the US. Uh, there are families, uh, but let me just group them into two broad classes. One class is focusing on the short run and is uh, actually um, looking at business fluctuations generated or driven by financial factors. And the other class is focusing on the long run and it's interested in uh, the determination of the growth path of the economy which is driven by embodied technical process and skill dynamics. You see immediately that uh, from this point of view, from the point of view of the uh, architecture that you can imagine for the agent-based model, there is nothing different from a standard macro model. So the type of issues are exactly the same. Also the distinction between short run and long run is, is, uh, is uh, common in macro. Uh, there are objections, objections coming from uh, the uh, mainstream of the profession 
and uh, uh, from canonical or standard macroeconomist, uh, they uh, simply says, first of all, that uh, uh, there is the wilderness of boundary rationality which is plaguing uh, agent-based models. There are too many and too diverse behavioral rules at the micro level. There, are, there is one way of being uh, rational and many ways of being irrational so, or banded irrational. So there is no discipline in uh, theorizing. The second rejection is that these rules are indeed uh, alien to the core of the uh, profession. That seems uh, sometimes uh, uh, bizarre or uh, uh, very out of uh, sync with respect to the standard macro. Now, my impression, and I am, uh, I am in the minority among the agent-based model, but my impression is that uh, this is uh, only uh, true in, on the surface. If you dig, dig deeper, you see that there are common threads that connect different uh, macro agent-based models. Moreover, which is even more important, uh, the agent-based models do use uh, ideas, notions, and sometimes also uh, analytical toolkits that uh, uh, come from the canonical macro to discipline their thinking at the stage of theorizing behavioral rules. Um, so, uh, for instance, for instance, some of the fundamental assumptions in this literature uh, can uh, uh, be uh, the, it's some, the, 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 the fundamental assumption concerning behavioral rules can be derived from simple optimization, albeit of a uh, uh, limited type uh, with local information and short horizons. So it is true that generally speaking, behavioral rules are heuristics or rules of thumb, but sometimes they can be derived from first principle in a, a with a limited scope for optimization. Uh, in, in a paper with Herbert David, the chapter of the Handbook of Computational Economics, uh, we show that this is indeed the case. And so you can see the parallel development of theorizing in the agent-based community and canonical macro uh, quite clearly. I don't have to uh, elaborate further on this point, I just may mention that the one area in which the similarity is, uh, uh, is evident is the case of financial frictions. Uh, as you know, financial frictions have been somehow added to the standard workhorse of macro, which is the DHG, uh, uh, New Keynesian DHG model, at a later stage. And from a certain point of view, uh, this is an epicycle, with, uh, with, which is added to uh, somehow uh, bring back a model which was uh, 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 failing in capture reality, bring back to, uh, to reality. But my, my uh, impression is that this epicycle per se contains uh, many grains of truth, which are simply necessary to build a sophisticated agent-based model. So cost restraint verification, collateral constraint, bankruptcy cost, all the fictions that you can, you can think of and that uh, are used to enrich a, an otherwise uh, empirically not robust model such as a DHG model can also be part of the stories that we teach, that we, that we uh, tell in the agent-based uh, agent models. Uh, <clears throat> the third objection is the following. In macro agent-based models, when you have a shock, things change, but you cannot actually trace back the change in the aggregate time series to the shock. So these models are black boxes. Uh, the, from this point of view, they are very different from the edge models in which uh, you can e neatly describe what is the effect of a, uh, of a macro uh, time series to a shock to impulse response functions. What I'm trying to do, we will try to do in the uh, few uh, minutes that I have left, is to show you an example of uh, trying to gain clarity in the description of what happens in a macroeconomic model after a shock at the cost of uh, giving up the richness and the intricacies of macro region based model. I'm referring to a paper that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Tiziana Senza, now at the Toulouse School of Economics, uh, published in the journal Economic Dynamics and Control. 
Uh, in so doing, we, in a sense, trying to reconcile uh, macroeconomic thinking and agent-based modeling. I will show you two instances of this reconciliation uh, momentarily. First of all, the issue of equilibrium and disequilibrium. As you have seen uh, at the very beginning of this talk uh, in the quotation from uh, Simon, disequilibrium is a phenomenon that you want to capture with agent-based model. Uh, this is a major methodological divide with uh, canonical macroeconomics where equilibrium is always uh, uh, at the center of the stage and you simply uh, uh, explore the departure from equilibrium that are going to disappear in the, in the long run. Now, um, most of the agent-based models are indeed concerned with disequilibrium. They do not impose equilibrium of any sort. In this hybrid macro uh, agent-based model, we show you that we can use uh, the notion of equilibrium and market clearing also in uh, uh, agent-based models of a hybrid type, uh, which I will show you just the basics, uh, a closed economy, household firms, the public sector, and financial intermediaries, wages and prices are constant, a very simple uh, model that at the end will be a simple ISLM model, but can be easily extended to different frameworks. Uh, the only uh, crucial distinction with respect to the standard models is that the firms are heterogeneous in terms of financial robustness. So you have a distribution of firms uh, according to net worth. The financial robustness is captured by net worth. Uh, we denote these uh, individual state variables a AIT, which is the ratio network to the capital stock, and then I will uh, refer to this, uh, to this variable as net worth from now on. And there are a number of uh, 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 firms in the economy. In the simulation, we have 1,000 firms. The distribution of uh, net worth is changing as endogenously over time. We don't pose any any a priori on the, uh, on the shape of the distribution itself. Uh, we start from these uh, population of heterogeneous firms. Then we uh, assume that each firm is solving a simple uh, static optimization problem, which is the maximization of profits net of uh, uh, expected bankruptcy cost. And we end up with uh, equation one, which says that the, at the individual level, investment, KIT, is a function of net worth, AIT minus one, like at one period. This function being increasing and concave. Notice that we are using myopic optimization techniques. This is one instance of reconciliation, as I said before. Uh, the, the, the second instance of reconciliation is of course the use of equilibrium uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, before. Now, the interesting point of this framework is that uh, you can represent uh, the uh, investment on the y-axis, network on the x-axis, and you have this uh, um, uh, upward sloping and concave function. K star is the first best, the level of investment which would maximize uh, 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 profit in the absence of uh, bank free cost. KR is the uh, level of investment that you get when you have a representative agent economy with friction. So the diff vertical difference between K star and KR is simply the uh, effect of the financial frictions without any heterogeneity. When you introduce heterogeneity, you, you uh, measure the net worth of uh, individual firms on the X axis. Suppose that there are just two uh, firms, just for, for example, A1 and A2. And so the uh, average investment is K. You see that K is smaller than KR because of Jensen inequality, but this difference is due to dispersion, so to the second moments of the distribution. Of course, you can imagine that uh, um, at the further moments of the distribution can be back. Excuse me? Just a minute or two to go. Just keep okay, going. okay, I'm, I'm finishing. Okay. So this is the, the starting point of the, uh, of the analysis. We put this thing into a uh, ISLM model. So we go from the individual to the average and uh, put together uh, consumption, investment, and public expenditure that is equal to income. And we get equation two, which is the equation of an IS curve. XT is the output gap. And you see the IS curve is parameterized to 
the moments of the distribution of network. We have a standard LM curve. We put together two teams and we have a moments augmented ASLM model. Very standard, uh, clearly uh, familiar to any macroeconomist. But the point is that the reduced form of this model is characterized by uh, the presence of the uh, moments of the distribution. Uh, now, uh, so far, you have simple macro model. Then you go for the agent-based model. The agent-based model in enter into the picture when you had to track the evolution over time of the distribution. Uh, uh, that is characterized by the laws of motion uh, in equation four. These are derived in the model. There is, there is not postulated. Uh, and R is the interest rate that you derive from the ASLM model. Now, the agent-based model is actually uh, mm, in, intervening only at the set, second stage. The first stage is that the macroeconomic model gives you the interest, interest, interest rate. And you feed this into the agent-based model. And then the agent-based model is uh, helping you to solve this nasty system of difference equations that are highly nonlinear through computer simulations. And then we end up with uh, the second feedback from the agent-based model to the macroeconomic model. The agent-based model is capable of generating the statistics which summarize the behavior of the distribution, uh, essentially the moments of the distribution itself. Uh, we uh, limit ourselves to the mean and the variance that feed into the macroeconomic model so that uh, the model can be closed and the uh, uh, equilibrium can be recomputed. Uh, Let me conclude uh, uh, on this point. This model can be used to explore the consequences of shocks. And the very important uh, advantage of this approach is that uh, the effect of a shock on the macroeconomy can be very neatly described. The uh, agent-based model is not a black box any, any longer. Moreover, you can decompose the effect of the shock on, say, GDP or the output gap in one component, which is due to the to the first moment of the distribution. And this is essentially the same effect that you would get in a representative agent economy. And in uh, uh, an effect which, is, uh, uh, which can be traced back to uh, higher moments of the distribution. In our case, only the second moment. There are, of course, pros and cons of this approach, but it could work as a useful complement to most behavioral disequilibrium agent-based model. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Muriel as in discussing. Yes, thank you very much. So I will be short and then you have time to want to work quickly to that question and we can discuss uh, in details later. I have only main, mainly three questions about your presentation. First, I think it was very clear, at least to me, what you explained about macro agent based models. So I will not focus on that, only on hybrid model. And the first point, you just explained that uh, hybrid model allow for a better traceability of the shocks via the moment and so on. But uh, so you explain what we can gain from doing such a model compared to the AG, which are rather a black box in the diffusion of, of uh, shocks into the model. But what do we lose compared to a standard macro agent based model? My question is perhaps more in terms of instability or are you still able to explain this way how a small shock can provoke a large scale crisis, for instance, so amplification. Then the second point is that uh, if you look at hybrid model, there are only few for the moment, but I'm not sure they are so homogeneous. So I think there are different strategies. But I'm not fully sure, I would like your opinion. Some of the people perhaps can have more a normative approach and they want to explore via hybrid model some situation they cannot explore in a DSG model. Some of them are changing then the very standard hypothesis of the model on the behavior of agent of the way they treat information or okay. And the one you propose, for instance, is different on the general framework is DSG and on one market you have agent based model. So sometimes it's for reason of comparison, I think, to compare the different results. Sometimes perhaps it's to be more realistic, I mean, on the side of the AGE to convince policymakers. So 
do you think that there are different strategies, different purpose, different sort of model who compose the hybrid model or do they share much more that I, I think, something like that. And then um, another point is that you mentioned at the beginning uh, concerning the empirical, empirical validation methods that now you are not only calibrating, you are doing estimation and so on. So do you think that in general, there is a convergence in the empirical validation process between the AGE and macro agent based model, perhaps also pushed by hybrid uh, model, I don't know if you increase the incentive for comparison. And to some extent, do you think that it is possible that uh, a part of the convergence, if there is a convergence one day between the two approaches could be driven by a convergence in empirical methods? Science, if you have some constraint on the empirical side, then this constrains you at the theoretical side, the way you model and so on. You are constrained in the way you model by the fact that after you want to apply some specific test. And uh, so do you think that the convergence, if possible, between the two can come from empirical side? I think at this point we'll move to Domenico and sort of let him respond to that. Domenico, have you also looked at the Q&A sort of questions that have come in? Not, not yet. Okay, but you, you you might after sort of you respond. Yeah, let, let, let me do the so following. Let me, let me sort of, because some of them are specific to you. And so I think it makes more sense that we continue this discussion um, okay. because I think it will sort of rather pull us, rather than pull us away. So go ahead, Domenico. Okay, so let me, let me uh, well, this is a very important question and question that I asked myself, uh, of course. Uh, we lose a lot, indeed, in terms of uh, uh, the richness uh, of uh, an agent-based model. Uh, and moreover, in a sense, we constrain uh, the agent-based model. When you, when you go for arbitration of the type that I have uh, shown you, we constrain the agent-based model into a straitjacket, which is somehow conducive to um, results that are not... Uh, uh, hugely different uh, from what you can get with a representative agent model. This is something that surprised myself and Tiziana when we, when we, when we built the model, but exactly by decomposing the effect of a shock into what is due to the representative agent and what is due to heterogeneity, we see that the part of heterogeneity is, is fairly small and times different of one order of magnitude with respect to the role of uh, uh, the uh, first moment, which is a result that I think depends on the uh, procedure of reconciliation that uh, uh, we impose, in particular the issue of equilibrium, and uh, which makes our results close in spirit to the result that you can get in, uh, um, um, say, neoclassical uh, endogenous business cycle models with heterogeneity a la Cruzel and Smith, where uh, indeed they too find that essentially the first moment is explaining almost all the variance of GDP. So who cares for the second or higher, higher moment? So in a sense, my, my, uh, my takeaway from these experiences is that in this there is a trade-off between uh, increasing clarity and uh, going towards a situation which reduce the impact of heterogeneity, which is not the case in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, macro region based model, indeed. Uh, let, me, let me put another uh, issue on the table. For instance, if you have a fiscal policy shock, usually the impact on the macroeconomy of uh, a shock is much smaller in hybrid region based model than in standard uh, macro region based model. So we have uh, plenty to lose. That's why I'm saying that they can be used, this hybrid macro model can be used uh, as complementary to, to uh, standard macro models. Can the hybrid uh, agent-based model generate a crisis? Well, no, matter of fact, no. They can generate an amplification mechanism. So from this point, this point of view, you have a, a standard financial accelerator story where you get relatively small impulse a big uh, response of the economy, which is driven by financial frictions. 
The point is that uh, the uh, financial accelerator, this magnification of the, of the shock is due to heterogeneity, which is captured by, as I said, this decomposition of the effects of the shock. But you don't see uh, what you can have in standard macrogen based model, which is a sudden recession, which, is, which comes from nowhere. It is not generated by a shock which is simply the effect of the endogenous evolving business cycle, which is the beauty, if you will, of a macroeconomic agent-based model. This is something that you could lose while going into hybridization. Uh, are there many uh, hybrid macrogen-based models out there? Not really, not of the type that we have proposed. Many people, however, do impose shortcuts in modeling uh, complex economies by uh, um, approaching hybridization in a very reductionist way. They simply, for instance, uh, cut short the dimensionality of a class of agents, suppose the banks, you use only one bank if you want to focus on the heterogeneity of firms and uh, vice versa if you want to focus on uh, if you want to make uh, to, to, to build the interbank market, you focus on the heterogeneity of banks and you don't care very much on the, uh, the heterogeneity of depositors and so on and so forth. But this is not exactly the same thing as an hybrid model as I and Tiziana were actually proposing. Okay. Uh, estimation, that's a very important point. Indeed, estimation of agent-based model uh, borrows uh, from standard techniques standard Bayesian techniques, and that's to adapt these techniques to an environment which is extremely complicated because uh, the agent-based model uh, uh, are characterized by the data generating process that is, unknown, that is unknown to the model, which is not the case with the AG models. You put into the, the AG model the shocks and the shocks are driving the dynamics and you know the uh, structure of the dynamics of the results because you know the structure of the dynamics of the shocks. It's not the case in agent-based models. Estimation is much more difficult and controversial issue. However, some uh, progress has been made. So from this point of view, indeed, Bayesian estimation is a tool that is used both by DSG modelers and agent-based modelers. And I think that is a thriving uh, uh, line of research from this point of view, methodologically speaking, certainly we're using, using the similar uh, statistical techniques. Um, should I answer? Yeah, take a look at the Q&A and yeah. answer any that you think you can answer quickly. We'll save broader ones for there. So if you just look at the Q&A, the questions that came in, or I can read them to you. Uh, one was, do agent-based models need the concept of equilibrium to define disequilibrium? Well, matter of factly, no, but you, you always have, uh, suppose that you think of the market for goods. Uh, equilibrium means that uh, total demand is equal to, uh, to income. If you have this equilibrium, of course, there is a difference between the two and you capture this by inventories accumulation, for instance. This is something that is, should be incorporated in agent-based model, but you don't have, don't have, absolutely don't have to impose equilibrium. Uh, the imposition of equilibrium is a, uh, a methodological point that we use in hybrid agent-based model with the consequence that I was discussing before. Um, then there is Eddie uh, uh, Gerba. Um, Okay. Yeah, that uh, it, it, Eddie is uh, making reference to agent, uh, the heterogeneous agent New Keynesian uh, models. Now, these are very interesting uh, uh, frameworks, of course. These are very interesting for the following reason, essentially. The uh, economists into this area show that uh, heterogeneity is important. So they move a step beyond Cruzel and Smith uh, um, and they are actually making a point which is empirically grounded uh, on the fact that uh, heterogeneity is playing a major role in explaining GDP fluctuation, which is, was not the case in Cruzel Smith uh, standard world. This is a way also of reviving uh, a line of thought which uh, in, uh, from Ayagari on was indeed the rage in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. 
And I think this is certainly a great uh, line of research. The uh, approach, however, is very different from agent-based model. The agent-based model start with uh, uh, very few assumptions. And the starting point there is simply taking a, a population of heterogeneous then agents and then from the modeler point of view, play with them, imposing behavioral rules. Then you can discuss what kind of behavioral rules. The um, agent, uh, heterogeneous agent new Keynesian model are uh, heterogeneous agent model that uh, go back to the uh, Ayagari, Kuzel, Smith, and so on type of tradition and add a new Keynesian twist. Very interesting, but of course, the methodology and the very philosophy that, uh, from the point of view of methodolo uh, methodology of agent, uh, heterogeneous agent new Keynesian model uh, uh, is different. And that's, that's essentially my, my take. The point is that these two line of thought uh, may talk to each other sooner or later. This is not the case so far, unless uh, Muriel uh, has something else to say about this. Uh, but I think this, this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting line, line of thought. Another of the questions was, if agent-based models are used for prediction, what is their relation with the rational expectations paradigm? What happens when agents of ABM are able to know the model? The, the, this is a very important point. That the agent-based models usually assume uh, adaptive expectations in a framework which, which is uh, indeed very complicated. And usually you assume that uh, agents all uh, can, can have heterogeneous expectation. One type of heuristic is adaptive expectations. Uh, the um, the agent-based model is certainly vulnerable to the Lucas critique. Uh, most of the agent-based models do not care that much because they don't believe in rational expectations at all. Uh, I do think that, however, when we introduce expectations in agent-based model, we had to uh, allow for a certain degree of heterogeneity in expectation formation. And we had to limit the number of heuristics used to forecast to, uh, uh, to a very low number. Uh, in, uh, for instance, in heterogeneous expectations models uh, uh, a la broken domes, this is exactly the case. There is a sound, uh, solid, uh, experimental evidence that people in the laboratory use a few few rules to forecast uh, the future. You can use this uh, kind of uh, evidence to calibrate agent-based model with heterogeneous expectations. What will be the uh, upshot of this experiment? Well, most of the times, adaptive expectations are indeed uh, playing a dominant role in uh, uh, Learning to in uh, in uh, heterogeneous agents, uh, heterogeneous expectations agent based model. Uh, but of course, uh, you cannot say that uh, people all rational expectations in these models. It would be very complicated to imagine that uh, uh, an agent has model consistent expectations, taking into account in these expectations that also other agents are different models. So that's uh, uh, the type of problem that we have. Uh, I'm okay. not sure. To move yeah. on to one, one very last question before we move on to Muriel. And this is for, thank you for the wonderful introduction. For some of us who may want to learn a little more, can you point to a book, website, or model framework that's accessible? I think that might uh, be. There are, there are plenty, uh, plenty of reference that I can make. Uh, in the presentation was mentioning a chapter of the handbook computational economics together with Herbert David. I think the old references are there. Sure. So I would, I would refer the interested reader to that chapter. There are plenty of, uh, of uh, works that have been published in the recent years and there has been a growing literature in the last 10 years or so. Okay, the... There were some other questions that we're not going to have time to deal with now, but you okay. can answer them you know, so online. So if you go to the Q and A, okay, can, I will try. We'll try to answer maybe online with the people that you know weren't provided. And now I think we should move on to the next presentation, which is going to be Muriel. Go ahead. I think we have to change the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will interrupt sharing screen. Thank you very much.
Okay. It's okay? Good. Okay, so I start. So thank you very much and thank you, Domenico. Thank you all of you. Um, what I will present here is the, a presentation based on several different work I started to work on since a few months. And I will try to be as brief as possible. So the idea of the paper is to uh, examine if there is a cross fertilization in macroeconomics focusing on the recent episode, the confrontation between DSGE models and macro agent based one. But before, in fact, speaking about cross fertilization, what we examine finally is whether it's possible to have such cross fertilization, because in fact, this means that uh, before measuring or evaluating cross fertilization, you have to be sure that there are a sort of exchange or dialogue between the two, uh, the two uh, fields. So, um, we structure the presentation as follows. The first two parts where we try to see each program of research, how they evolve, and uh, if there is, a, a, let's say, a totally autonomous research agenda. And after, we will examine through different aspects. We do not imagine here that we can all the possible way they could influence each other, but we will try to measure a sort of mutual influence. If there is a convergence between the two programs, if a macro agent base influence the AGE or the reverse, how much. Um, so the idea first is to see if there is a sort of dialogue of exchange between the two competing approach. The context in which we start that uh, research program is that you have a standard narrative largely diffused, which explained that from uh, very uh, early 70s, the work of uh, Lucas after the RBC and finally the DSG model with Woodford, let's say, of course, there were other uh, contributions after. There is a sort of linear and uh, um, linear history with uh, each model being more sophisticated and more elaborate than the previous one and so implicitly the idea that there is a linear progress in macroeconomics. Okay, so the linear progress is characterized by the progressive integration of Keynesian aspect and it was also supported to some extent by the fact that during many years we had the great moderation so that uh, empirically those models seems to be validated. From the beginning, there were very strong critics from the uh, opposite side, of course, but not only. Many people identified very early that uh, it would be good to have heterogeneity, more heterogeneity in both models. Otherwise, we may have some difficulty to really explain and not only mimic uh, business cycle fluctuation. And then from the early 2000 years, uh, literature, which uh, slowly was uh, growing, uh, emerge is the adjunct based computational economics model and the second generation of papers or literature, which uh, we will refer to as a macro adjunct based model. So we not explain in details because Dominico did it. It's why we reverse the way we present, we organize the session and we start first. But the idea is that most model looks very interesting, but they also need a numerical simulation. So finally, they were seen as rather uh, fragile in their results. And uh, in short, the number of parameters and explicit or implicit choice of behavior um, makes that the model appears to some extent uh, unreli unreliable or arbitrary. So the main arguments of people was that if we cannot have, uh, um, we cannot have, uh, let's say, um, sufficiently uh, regular result, then we should be, we should have more discipline. If we cannot control fully what happened in the model, then we should have more discipline. After the crisis, the situation changed a little bit. I go quickly, it's a sort of caricature, but uh, okay. The thing changed and uh, the field macroeconomics is characterized by two dimensions. On the one side, the DSGE models, their ability to explain empirical evidence, macro fluctuation, has been increasingly questioned. Not only they were not able okay, to forecast the crisis, this is different, but to better, to really explain and to give good advice about the way to solve the problem. Okay, so 
there have been recent progress on Rad Frontier, but I have no time to speak about that. And the other point is that those models finally appear as uh, having a lack of transparency too. So in fact, one of the arguments they opposed to macro adjoint based model was not anymore so strong. On the other side, we had an increasing number of papers using adjoint based methodology, which has been published. The emergence of communities in that uh, subfield and with the emergence of communities, we have a decreasing number of alternative models, competing models, I mean, inside the group of macro adjoint base. And this is seen as a positive uh, uh, impact because the less you have models, the more you can build on them. And then you have a core model and not the large variety, which, which led some people to think that uh, with macro adjoint based model, we can have too many sorts of results. In addition, there is a sort of, we just spoke about that, technical improvement of estimation, calibration, simulation. So better results, which are more stable empirically and which can be compared to what is op obtained by DSG model. And finally, which is of course very interesting, but Romain will speak about that in the next presentation, is that there is a larger interest, not only from academics, so enlargement of the community of people doing agent-based model, but also from the practitioners. And some central banks start to think about agent-based model. You can have to have a look about uh, the nature of the debates. I think it's very interesting to look at these two special issues, Oxford Review of Economic Policy and the Journal of Economic Perspective one. They both publish two special issues. The first one is uh, mainly driven by macro adjunct based people uh, supporting not, not only macro adjunct based people, but people criticizing heavily DSG model and the fact that they were not successful enough during the crisis and after in explaining how to remedy the crisis. And then there is the, in the Journal of Economic Perspective, uh, let's say DSG people explaining that it's not because they could not address all the questions before that they cannot do now. They thought it was not so fundamental, but now they can do and they can address everything more or less. So this is not the, you cannot summarize all the debates in those two, uh, reading those two issues, but this give a good idea of the current state of the debates. So the question we address here, it is the increasing importance of macro adjunct based model. What, what, what does it mean exactly? The importance of macro adjunct based model, what does their sphere or influence? And on the other side, an increasing variety of DSG model. And it is exactly the same. What sort of variety it is? Is it only a variety in topics, but no fundamental, fundamental change in the nature of the model? Does it has really an impact on the field? It is a large transformation. So the idea is to make a first step here, only a first step to try to interpret if there is a transformation in DSG models. Uh, is it due to macro adjunct based literature or not? And whether adjunct based are influenced by uh, DSG model. So just one point, I start this work alone and I realize that the literature is very large. So this paper is based partly on analytical work I did trying to identify common routes, uh, mechanism and uh, okay, and how this model uh, discussed together or not, these two literature. But then I thought I should start to have more quantitative um, estimation of those questions. And I start to learn, but quickly I decide because I'm not an expert to cooperate with people in Siena. So Alberto Bacine, Martina Attioni and Eugenio Petrovic. We have just started. So if there are mistakes, they are only mine, but I use some of the first uh, slide we have together. So I wanted to mention this here. So the first part, quickly, the autonomy, the autonomy of macro adjunct based model. In fact, many people present uh, those model as a reaction to, in the large sense, equilibrium business cycles model. So let's see what we can uh, identify here. So we have, um, we took a Scopus and we identified the literature. We start in 2000 until uh, last year. And we find many, many papers, of course, in uh, dealing with DSG model uh, and less papers dealing with macro adjunct based model, but quite a few, in fact. And you can see that, uh, of course, uh, as we could expect it, there is an increasing tendency uh, 
an increasing number of papers, but uh, this uh, first draft analysis gives interesting elements. First of all, you can see that um, even if they were highly criticized, the DHGE model never stopped to be published and to be people never stopped to work on them. The contrary, then there is a sort of intensification of the publication rate on the DHGE model. Number of papers are increasing on both sides, but you can see the rate is much more important on the DHGE side. Okay. Uh, we have to be careful in that diagram and the the scales are different because there are less papers published in microgen based model. This is clear. And this perhaps can explain a little bit the variability, the volatility of the, in the number of publications. Okay, we, you can see that in both cases, people start to work uh, intensively because they have started to work before, but at a smaller scale, but they start to work intensively before the crisis. So you cannot imagine that those models were developed just in reaction of the crisis. And you cannot imagine either, but we will see later, that they were developed in reaction to each other. So the AG model, despite the criticism after the crisis, the rate of publication of those model has never significantly decreased. So as on the contrary, it has increased. And macro based model, you can see also they were not elaborate in reaction of the crisis. They start much before, okay. So partly it was, uh, I could speak about the story of uh, equilibrium business cycles model, but I think this is rather well known. So I do not focus here, but if you say a few words about the history of macro based model, partly sincerely there were answers to equilibrium business cycles model. They were certainly stimulated by that, but it is also simply the continuity of former research program. I cannot be exhaustive here, and it is true that making that listing, I focus mainly in my work on financial instability, models who try to emphasize financial instability, but nevertheless. And then you can identify different research programs which start much before and people continue them through uh, agent-based model, macro agent-based model, Minskian research program, Schumpeterian research program dealing with innovation, creative destruction, Keynesian research program, information theory, so from the new Keynesian insight, Dizikilum Micro Foundation in the line of Leon Food Clover, the work done by Howitt today, network analysis, and so on. And of course, all this work was based on the Santa Fe Institute research program, deeply influenced by them. But when I mentioned of the list of topics, I wanted to speak about not the technical apparatus, but the, the, the topic they emphasize. Okay. Uh, there is an increasing number of publications, especially after 2011, and you can also identify that there is a strong, uh, a really important organization of the field with different society, conference, journal, and also a higher participation to economic policy debate, which perhaps was not so much the case at the beginning of this field developed. And then if you look at the top journal on both sides, you can see that um, you have a long list on both sides, but the interesting point is that in the case of macroagent based model from 2000 until now, you have uh, in the top journal of the field, uh, many journals which do not belong to economics, they belong to other fields of research. So on one way, you have a very identified community, but on the other way, you can see also that this uh, literature developed independently of the community of economists because both journals are not ranked, uh, ranked are not um, uh, in the set of, uh, are not identified, sorry, as pure uh, economic journal. Okay, so there is a clear autonomy. The second part, it is, uh, the symmetric question, do we consider that DSG evolve under the pressure of macro agent base? When people think about that, they do not think about the first development of DSG, the they think about the development after the crisis, more or less, the fact that DSG start to speak about heterogeneity, expectations, and so on, and that this, they were pushed in that direction by macro agent base. Uh, this is not fully true. We try to look at this through three main topic, which seems quite relevant and uh, which has uh, um, led to several publications, especially from the mid-2000 uh, year. And you can see that uh, 
concerning financial sphere, financial intermediation, um, um, the ESG model has started to work before the crisis. Okay, sorry. You can see here that before 2008 and with the timeline for publication, this is even more obvious that they start before, okay? They start to work on financial, uh, uh, instead, finan the role of financial intermediary before the crisis. And you can see on macro joint based model that it was very important. More volatility is true, but the number of publication is smaller. So perhaps this uh, volatility is explained by the smaller set of papers, but then um, it starts much before and also before the crisis. Okay. Um, Sorry, I went too quickly. So this is true for the financial sphere. This is true for heterogeneity. They start much before the crisis. And this is true also for introducing a more elaborate theory of expectation in the model with heterogeneity of the agent and so on and incomplete uh, information set. So first topic of uh, convergence. Uh, it is clear that there is a clear intensification of the paper on those topic after the crisis, but in both cases, they start before. Concerning the AGE, perhaps it's just the progressive expansion of the model, the way they usually develop, so starting with a core model and then integrating step by step uh, other issues like uh, money issues, financial issues, expectation, etc. For macro agent based model, it was more present for the beginning, so it's more linked to the analytical route of uh, model and people involved in that new emerging field, so it's more a question of heritage, let's say. So the topic which are, are addressed by macro agent based model are also analyzed by DAG. Macro, macro agent based model and DAG develop at the same period the same sort of uh, a model, let's say, the same topic, but they have distinct roots. So clearly, it's difficult to, to imagine that there is a strong convergence. More than that, I cannot enter into detail here, but as Domenico explained, their methodology still differ a lot, this equilibrium dynamic, feedback, emergence property. So clearly, uh, there is a still uh, two, uh, two different fields which do not communicate a lot. So what we can say is that there is a convergence in the agenda, but does this mean that there is a mutual influence? This is not clear. It could be that those two literature has just identify the same important challenging economic issues and then try to, 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 to grasp them, to address them. So what we try to see now is the mutual influence. So first, is there a convergence or cross-fertilization or just co-evolution. So when we try to, uh, um, when we uh, compute, uh, let's say, select the two sets of papers, the SGE and macro agent base, we had uh, only a small overlap between the two sets, which means that we had a reasonable keyword because a big overlap would have been a, a, bad, a bad choice of keywords and not proper a set. Or two to go. Yeah, okay. And then the idea is that in both documents, 20 documents, okay, 22 documents, they are, uh, which are common to the two sets, they are only macro agent based model. Okay, so it is only macro agent based model who refer also to DAG in the keyword and not the reverse. Okay, I skip that. The other one we can do is to look at the top cited authors between DAG and macro agent based. And we can see that there is a small overlap, 72, so not many, okay? The two literature are still very uh, distinct. But the most interesting thing is that if you look at those authors which are quoted by the two literature, many there are uh, DAGE uh, authors. If you look at the list of the 21st name, it is only the very last one, Rovantini, who is a macro agent based modeler. The other one, quote by the two literature are only the AGE people, okay, modeler. So the idea is that it's rather asymmetric. Macro agent based modeler refer systematically or very often to the AGE model, not systematically, but the reverse is not true. If you look, uh, you take the two major um, um, uh, journal of each side, the Journal of Economic Dynamic and Control on one side and the American Economic Review on the other side, 
you can see that these are the number of publications dealing with microagent based in the G, uh, GDC. And the, the number of, among those papers, the number of, uh, the number of papers quoting the AG are 16%. If you do the same on uh, adjunct uh, on in the American Economic Review, you take the DSG paper published and you look among this set of paper, how many uh, quote uh, the macro adjunct based model, then it is only 6%. Okay. So there is clearly an asymmetric influence and even what was, uh, this is not so surprising, but uh, what is more surprising is that uh, there was the idea that macro adjunct based model refers systematically to the mainstream because they are, they are built in opposition to the mainstream. This is not true. They refer to the mainstream, to the AGE. The reverse is not true, but not systematically and not that much. So cross fertilization is not so obvious. So what does it mean? There is no influence, uh, not strictly. Alors, first, um, I will not speak about the nature of this model, but how to explain how how Dominic uh, already explained, there were hybrid macro models. And this is the proof that macro adjunct based feel uh, not necessary to, to do cross fertilization per se, but at least to have some dialogue, at least it is the way I interpret it, some dialogue with the DSGE model. So the emergence of hybrid model is a way to have comparison with a pure DSG model and then to have a sort of dialogue, okay? Then the other way, the nature of the transformation of the DSG model, is there some influence on the macro adjunct base? We cannot consider that uh, um, there is a fundamental reconsideration of the SGE uh, model, the SGE approach. There is nevertheless a sort of inflection. This is true, there is not nothing. First, the fact that uh, the SGE model engage in some new topic uh, had the consequence to increase their diversity. I cannot explain now, but the fact that they decide to address uh, more often the question about uh, financial sphere and the integration to better explain fluctuation, uh, is a source of uh, segmentation because depending the way they integrate the financial sphere, there are totally different sort of model. And this is a sort of segmentation in the sense that those, those models do not draw exactly the same conclusion, even if it allows conservation of a core model, the very core model, but mm, quickly there are different groups of models. So DAG first appear less monolithic One and minute, there are Okay, how, how many times did you say? One minute? Minus, minus one minute. Okay, I'm finished. I finished, okay. So there is the idea that because of this diversity and segmentation, some models become more permeable to a sort of endogenous instability. Second, there are some reflection in some of the models, not all of them. I would not call them uh, hybrid model, but they think about new micro foundation. And, uh, there are some kind of uh, behavioral Keynesian DSG model or what is called also not exactly the same, the ANC heterogeneous adjunct new Keynesian model. So they try to work on new micro foundation and those models are also for some of them quite disruptive compared to the core DSG approach. But at the end, the methodology, the equilibrium methodology is not totally different. It's a different micro foundation, but the full methodology is not fully different. So thinking about the future of macro, clearly, whatever people say, there is no abandonment of the DSG. It's totally the different which happen. There is clearly an inflection of part of the literature with the emergence of hybrid model, but not very clear what they will have become. A diversity of model, it is clear, pushed by the expansion of topic by the issue covered. So less monolithic approach, but the same fundamental method. So let's see if uh, it is a source of diversity. And what we can see also is a growing convergence in empirical validation. And this was in my question to Domenico. I think that perhaps a part of the convergence can be driven in the future by this uh, constraint imposed by common empirical validation method. So, so far we observe only a fragmentation of the literature, not a total absorption of one literature by the other. 
And perhaps this is uh, the proof that there is a resurgence of dialogue and debates uh, and controversies in macroeconomics, which were overlooked since uh, we had the consensus of the new synthesis. Okay. So we'll move on to the discussion quickly, Romain. Yeah, thanks, uh, Muriel, for the talk. Uh, I'm going to be quick. I have one comment and, uh, and a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. My comment is about how you, you frame your story. Mm -hmm. So you are interested in, in the existence of mutual influences between DSG and agent-based models. But uh, correctly if I'm wrong, but your conclusion is that there is almost no influence. So I would suggest to, to frame the article a bit differently. You show that the same issues are addressed in the DSG and in the agent, macro-agent based model communities. So the puzzle is why do they not influence each other? And I think from, from this question, you could raise not only methodological issues, but also technological issues and sociological issues. Let me just give you one example of what I mean by technological issues. I had the opportunity to, to talk with a, a, a scholar from the Bank of Canada, and she's, she uh, builds uh, agent-based models, and she collaborated recently with someone that is used to build um, DSG model. And they, they struggle a lot to have this collaboration. And the reason why they struggle a lot is that, the, so basically the DSG guy arrived with a DINAR and she is used to, to code with uh, Java. And the, the, the two um, coding approach are really different. And it turns out to be really complicated to talk, just to talk to each other because of that. Um, so this is for the comment. Now, uh, regarding my question, I have two questions. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you argue that macro agent based models have a long history. So this history traces back to disequilibrium economics you mentioned, but also in the slide I read, there was the mention of Schumpeter. So here's the question. How do you explain that given this kind of long history, a macro agent based model emerged only in the 2000s? And uh, second question, um, I, was, I was interested in, the, in what you said about where macro agent based models were published. So it seems that they were published in, in, in journals that are not economic journals. And I was wondering whether this uh, evolves and how, if that's the case, how do you interpret this evolution as like the evolution of the field of macro agent based models? Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I agree with you that I could start just asking why there is not such a cross uh, fertilization. To be honest, that presentation is more the way I, I thought step by step and then I investigate the question that the way I will write now a paper. But now I not, I'm, do not fully agree with you because uh, there is no cross fertilization in the sense that the two sides are not communicated as much as we expected, okay, or as we could have expected. But what is true is that they transform the landscape and that some communities emerge in between. And what I do not know for the moment, it is if those community will simply disappear because they have not, uh, they do not contribute enough to the question on macro, whether they will merge and go on the side on macro agent base, let's say doing more uh, decentralized approach and uh, okay, or this ID, or perhaps the ID they introduce will be taken by DSG approach and then transformed to be integrated in a way, transform, okay, not strictly the same, but in DSG. So I'm not sure, I have no idea. I will not try to guess what will happen, but it is true that between the two, you are right, the two communities do not communicate enough, but there is uh, many things in between the two communities now. So I went quickly at the end, but it is why what I would like to emphasize. It is this fragmentation. Then I'm not sure that this fragmentation will be uh, permanent and I don't know what will happen. The second point, perhaps the, the journal first is more easy. Uh, the journal, yes, uh, we took the period as a whole. And, 
as a comp if you take the period, uh, one single period from 2000 until now, we could have started a little bit before. Then it is true that uh, those uh, papers were published in journal, not uh, exclusively economic journal, but this has changed over time. So what we are working on now is to have different sub periods and to show how much, uh, it's not surprising at the beginning because there was clearly a pluridisciplinary approach. So people, people spoke to people using the same tools and so on, and they have to be admitted, recognized by economists. We can understand, but uh, we want to assess uh, better how this evolved and which kind of journal now publish or not in economics this sort of approach and if there is still a need to publish uh, uh, in other journal than economic journal alors now why they develop uh, only in the 2000 uh, years um, perhaps dominico has the answer and we can uh, answer later but i don't think it is the uh, the only argument, but it is true that the development in computer science, in code language, and so on, has a strong influence. This is clear. Nevertheless, I'm annoyed with that because there are many uh, works which were developed before, which were of fundamental importance to arrive at the end to the macro region base. Without the work some people did on network analysis, financial network analysis, or the contribution of Stiglitz on information and so on, I'm not sure those model macro region base would have emerged as they emerge now with or without the computer uh, science improvement, capabilities improvement. So there was uh, uh, technical progress in computer, of course, in data storage, in soft, all this is important. This explains perhaps why this happened only in these years. But the general tendency, I think, in many different factors contribute to the fact that those model emerged only in the 2000, early 2000, and specifically this category of model and not something else. Okay, I don't know if I answered. Okay, we have a number of questions in the Q&A. I'll just read a couple of them to you. Is it possible to track whether the post-crisis references to GSGE, which interestingly continue to grow, are positive or negative? Sorry, I did not hear. I was cut. Sorry. Whether the references are positive and negative, you know, that you discussed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have a problem of sound. Ah, okay. Um, uh, in general, the reference to, um, sorry, uh, Beatrice, thank you. The reference to post-crisis uh, DSG model, uh, in general, from the macro region based side point of view, it is still negative, but it is true that in uh, science last year, more or less, there are some new models on the DSG side, which are very interesting and allow some sort of amplification of crisis. So I have to check in the very recent uh, uh, months if the tone has changed or not. Okay, I don't know if I answer correctly. Okay, another question here was, will there be an integration of big data aspects in macro models? Are ABM closure to this, are ABM closer to this than DSGE or even the Valrhesian GE model? I'm not fully sure. Perhaps I can take some time to think about that and give a clear answer at the end. Uh, and Dominico also may have some comments. I think that those models are more close to... I see ABM mm -hmm. models as very close to sort of artificial yeah. intelligence. That I think is the direction that they will move and they'll move in the direction of big data. But that's just my particular view. But I'm not sure they are really using, they are using sometimes algorithms and so on, but uh, it's, the, it's a little bit different than big data. But of course, they are closer to big data than DSG, as, as DSG are now. I don't know how they will evolve, but yes. I, I think it's the deep learning sort of structure within the empirical work. And what we haven't discussed in this section is the relationship to a lot of the empirical work. Um, and so I think there's issues there. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, one last question. Um, why do we want to sort of push convergence among DSGE and macro ABM? Do we really want to push the idea that 
idea of two tools that answer the same questions? Do we need two of them? My view is that we could instead think of two approaches as complements. Um, they're just tools. Yeah, but me, I do not push to convergence. I wanted just to see whether these two fields communicate or not. Um, as far, uh, I, I work a lot on the two literature and my impression is that it is more the DSG modelers who want to have one model explaining everything, not the reverse. And uh, yes, as macroeconomics, um, I think uh, there is no reason to have one single model, but uh, this is a question, a matter of opinion. Some people will think that, yes, we need one single model to explain every sort of situation. Other will think that, no. Me, I do not push for a, a convergence. I wanted to see whether those two fields communicate because my impression as historian was that many people say, oh, the macro agent base develop only in reaction to DAG. DAG is a continuous progress. And finally, they will integrate what, they, what is interesting for macro agent based and they will do better. And on the other side, people saying, okay, macro agent based, DAG will disappear because of the crisis. They cannot explain enough what happened. And then uh, macro agent based model will become the dominant approach. I think the both are totally wrong and that mainly what happens is that there is again some sort of dialogue in very tiny uh, space and that this gives to a sort of fragmentation of model and this is interesting. It is interesting for the episode itself and it, uh, it is interesting to see, uh, to take it as a case study to see how macroeconomics can evolve and their rich influence and um, what they are ready to accept or not, and the role of communities, of structuration of communities, so different questions you can address after. But. Good. I think we'll move on to our third paper now, which is by Romain Poisson. Um, so I think he should take over, share his screen. Perfect. Can you see the slides? No. Yeah, yes. Thanks for organizing this, uh, this uh, session and thanks to all of you uh, for attending the, the session. So previous uh, speaker focused on uh, how DSG and agent-based model evolved in the academia. Right now, I'm going to focus on the development of agent-based models in policymaking institutions. The focus is on central banks. Um, Okay. Uh, after the financial crisis of 2008, several central banks developed agent-based models. The list includes the Bank of England, uh, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Canada, the Kansas City Fed, or the St. Louis Fed. The goal of my article is to shed light on this recent development. In every case, um, the adoption of agent-based modeling occurred after the crisis. But the crisis uh, does not explain everything. The proof is that not all central banks developed an agent-based model after 2008. For instance, neither the Bank of France nor the Swiss National Bank did. It follows the first question, under which conditions agent-based model breached the walls of central banks? Then um, there is the issue of the size of the bridge. Is uh, agent-based modeling used to inform a wide range of policies in which division economists use agent-based model in central bank? And last but not least, there is the issue of the fate of agent-based models in central banks. Is the bridge going to narrow or on the contrary to widen? What are the forces underlying the deployment of agent-based model in central bank? My article aims to address or to propose answer to these questions. And my case study is the Bank of England. Agent-based model did not incorporate the Bank of England's toolkit at once. The technique was used a first time in 2008, but there was no follow-up. It was as if a driving force was missing. However, the situation changed after 2016. On one side, three agent-based models were developed between 
2016 and 2018. And on the other side, between 2016 and 2019, four working papers advocated for the use of agent-based model in policymaking. So the question is what happened between 2008 and 2016? And it turns out that answering this question is key to understand the development of agent-based model at the Bank of England. On the other hand, the bank offers the highest number of working papers in which agent-based models are discussed. Focusing on this institution was therefore a way to have the maximum of information on their use in policy making. Now, just let me say a few words on my methodology of research. I, start, I started my investigation by analyzing the properties of agent-based models. I focused on the way they are built, on their empirical content, and on their limits. However, this turned out to be insufficient to explain their use at the Bank of England. Let me take one example. Agent-based modeling has been known for its capacity to explain financial bubble since the 90s. But it was not until 2016 that agent-based model served to inform the bank's financial stability policy. This shows the limit of a study that would be centered on the properties of agent-based model. I therefore had to complete the study. So what do we know? We know that agent-based models are appropriate for explaining how financial markets work. So it seemed to me relevant to study the recent reforms of the UK regulatory system. We also know that programming skills are necessary to develop agent-based models. So I start asking myself, did the bank recently hire computer scientists? What are the constraints posed by the use of software like Java or Python? And in the end, my article replaces the use of agent-based model in their political, institutional, intellectual, and material context. Because of this method, uh, I used a wide range of documents. I used legislative texts, uh, political speeches, uh, BOS reports, working papers, and blog posts. And I also interviewed several members of the bank. For instance, I interviewed um, Arthur Surel and uh, a former member of the bank, Karen Brown Musinger. Based on uh, the data collected, I obtained three results. First, I show that institutional reforms were central to the adoption of agent-based models. So, second, I show that so far, agent-based models have been a marginal tool at the bank. Third, I show that the context is favorable to the deployment of agent-based models at the Bank of England. The rest of my presentation will elaborate on these uh, three results. The first result concerns uh, the process of adoption of agent-based models. These diagrams gives you an overview of what I show in my article. What I show is that there is a causal link between the 2008 crisis and the development of agent-based models. I also show, and this is important, that the causal link involved two institutional reforms, the Financial Services Act, which gave the responsibility for the financial stability to policy to the Bank of England, and the One Mission, One Bank plan, which basically changed how the Bank of England performed its mission. Now, let me um, give flesh and bones to, to this history. The starting point is the financial crisis. All around the world, policymakers blame the financial crisis on the failure of regulatory systems. In the UK, Lord Turner was a case in point. In a report commissioned uh, by the Treasury, Turner made two observations. On one side, he stressed the neglect of systemic risks. Before the crisis, the, final, the Financial Services Authority was responsible for the financial stability of the UK. 
The problem was that risks were monitored without taking into account the interdependencies between financial institutions. So Turner concluded that the financial services authority neglected the type of feedback effects that were central to the crisis. On the other side, Turner stressed what he called a legal vacuum on macroprudential policy. The UK Parliament had not specified which institution was responsible for the regulation of systemic risks. And as a result, taking these two arguments of, um, of Turner, we can conclude that there were gaps in the UK regulatory system. And in my article, I show that the Financial Services Act intended to solve these gaps. So now let's move to the second step of my history. Mark, Mark Carney became the BOE's governor a few months after the Financial Services Act uh, passed. His responsibility was therefore to operationalize uh, the parliament's mandate. And this led him to implement a huge reform called the One Mission, One Bank Plan in 2014. This plan implied many organizational transformation. But here, I would like to focus on two changes. First, Carnet defined a research agenda adapted to the new mandate of the bank. In particular, Carnet institutionalized research on the interactions between monetary, macroprudential, and microprudential policies. The second change was an important one uh, for my history. Uh, the second change was the creation of the Advanced Analytics Division. The goal was to build an in-house expertise in the analysis of big data. And what's important here is that is the composition of this new division. Executive members decided to build a multidisciplinary team. Starting from 2014, the, the BOE therefore hired mathematicians, computer scientists, linguists, and physicists. I insist on the hiring of physicists because it plays a role in the first step of my history. Of those recruited, there was a specialist in agent-based modeling. His name is Arthur Thurel. Thurel joined the Advanced Analytics Division in 2015. And since then, it was central to the development of agent-based models at the Bank of England. He either wrote or was the co-author of almost every working paper devoted to agent-based modeling. This is a proof of how Carnet's reform contributed to the adoption of agent-based model at the Bank of England. But this is not the only proof, right? Um, in my article, I also show that Carnet's reform stimulated a demand for agent-based model. This quotation is useful to understand why. Remember, to fulfill the bank's mandate, Carnet defined a new research agenda. He particularly insisted on the need to study the interaction between monetary, macroprudential, and macroprudential policies. According to Misa Tanaka, ABM are appropriate for this purpose. It therefore seemed natural to look at agent-based models. And for all these reasons, agent-based models eventually took root at the BOE. Now, I would like to discuss how agent-based models have been used at the Bank of England. And uh, to begin this discussion, I'm going to propose you a mapping exercise. Where can we find agent-based models at the Bank of England? We know that um, three agent-based models have been developed uh, since Carnet's reform. There was an agent-based model of the housing market, an agent-based model of the corporate bond market, and there was an agent-based model of the foreign exchange market. Thanks to this table, it's easy 
to identify where BOE's economies worked when building these three agent-based models. And if you take a look carefully, you, you can identify three clusters. First, most of the staff was affiliated to the financial stability strategy and risk directorates. Second, two of the three models were developed by economists in, uh, from the capital markets uh, division. Third and finally, uh, the elaboration of the agent-based model of the housing market involved mainly economists from the macro financial risk uh, division. From there, uh, I start checking uh, job openings of the bank. And this helped me to identify what are the responsibility of each entity. And the three entities are supposed to inform the Bank of England macroprudential policy. We therefore have here a rough idea of how agent-based models are used at the Bank of England. But let me, let me more precise. In my article, I uh, analyze how agent-based models are used, I analyze their structure, and I analyze their main properties. And my conclusion is that, so far, agent-based models have been a marginal tool at the BOE. Let me explain why. While um, developing agent-based models, BOE's economists were concerned with the dampening of fluctuation on markets. They were not concerned with the resilience of financial institutions. However, recent work in political science showed that this is the most important aspect of actual macroprudential policies. This is the first reason why I consider that agent-based models are a marginal tool at the Bank of England. Then, agent-based models could not be used to address the coordination between macroprudential and monetary policies. This has to do with their structure. Either the real sector was not represented or its interaction with the financial sector were extremely limited. This is the case in the agent-based model of the housing market. Neither the market for goods nor aggregate demand were formalized. As a result, the model could not determine how credit restrictions reduce aggregate demand and, for instance, lead inflation to undershoot the target. This uh, situation uh, contrasts with uh, DSGE models. At the BOE, DSGE models are used in the monetary policy area and in the financial stability area. And this contrast is the second reason why in my view, agent-based models are a marginal tool at the Bank of England. Now the question is whether this situation might change in the future. And uh, to begin, I think it's worth noting that several economists keep working on IBM at the Bank of England. This is the case of Azu Uluk and Mark Interschweger. These two economists contributed to the elaboration of the agent-based model of the housing market. And right now, they are working on its expansion. Such a cumulative work is important because it allows to perpetrate the use of agent-based model. However, it does not guarantee a broader use of the modeling technique. So let me reformulate the question. Can we expect a use of, of agent-based model, for instance, to perform stress tests or to inform the Bank of England's monetary policy? And to help finding an answer, I think it's useful uh, to identify what could prevent the deployment of agent-based model at the Bank of England. In my article, I identify five constraints. During an interview, Karen braun musinga called my attention to the financial constraint. She told me that while sharing her experience that we need to get over a hill of investment to use agent-based model. So the question is whether the Bank of England is ready to fund research to develop an agent-based model for stress testing or monetary policy. The second constraint concerns calibration. Calibration as uh, Muriel stressed and Dominico too is a weakness of agent-based modeling. 
agent-based model have shown a capacity to match stylist facts, but policymakers usually expect more accuracy. It's not enough uh, to determine or explain whether the economic situation is going to be better or worse after an economic shock. What wants uh, policymakers are figures. This is particularly true in the monetary policy area. So a broader use of IGMS model will therefore depend on their capacity to provide forecasts. The third constraint um, has to do with uh, programming skills. The development of agent-based model require an expertise in computer programming. And the problem is that economists are seldom trained in the use of language adapted to agent-based model. The lack of training in Java is a case in point. So again, uh, the capacity of the agent-based model to, de to, to be developed further is to have access to such skills. Then, and this is the uh, last constraint, it has to do with, um, with computer power. Now, this is the fourth constraint, the computer power. Several projects from the bank intend to expand the use of mo agent-based model. And most of them imply the elaboration of larger, large scale agent based model. The problem is that the bigger is the model, the harder it is to run a simulation. So the, the deployment of agent based model will depend on the availability of supercomputer. Last but not least, there are resistances vis a vis agent based modeling. And this quotation helps to understand where are the resistances. It comes from uh, Francesca Monti. According to Francesca Monti, agent-based model cannot be used to inform monetary policy. Transmission mechanisms are unclear and agent-based models are not immune to the Lucas critique. Of course, we could consider that Monti's position is not representative of the monetary analysis directorate, but Monti was an important member of the bank. She notably contributed to the elaboration of the framework currently used to inform the BOE's monetary policy. On the other hand, we also know, thanks to uh, Domenico Notabli, that such criticism are often formulated in the DSG community. It is therefore likely that many members of the Monetary Analysis Directorate are on Monty's page. The deployment of agent-based model will therefore depend on how strong the resistance against their use is. Now the constraints are clear, so we can reformulate the question. Could this constraint prevent the deployment of agent-based model at the BOE? And my answer is no. And I would like to conclude by explaining why. I'm, in my article, I show that the context is favorable to the loosening of each constraint. The resistance against agent-based modeling is particularly strong in the DSG community. But after the crisis, DSG modeling was under fire, right? At the BOE, Carnet and others criticized DSG models for their inability to guide policy decisions during the crisis. At the same time, DSG modelers also recognized the limits of their tool. Jesper Linde, Frank Smets, and Raphael Wouters are cases in point. As a result, it has become, I think, more difficult to oppose the use of other methodologies like agent-based modeling. Then, high-ranking officials advocate for the use of agent-based model at the Bank of England. Carnet did it uh, while presenting the One Bank in, uh, Research Agenda. Alden on his side uh, also did it on several occasions. And history shows that uh, such a support is central to a broader use of a modeling technique in central banks. High-ranking uh, officials have the capacity to orient resources toward one research on, uh, or another. And this is exactly what happened with agent-based model. Uh, under Carnet's leadership, for instance, they decided at the end to uh, give money to a project to develop an agent-based model adapted to stress tests. Finally, uh, the constraints uh, posed by calibration and computer programming are loosening. It is analyzed uh, by many actors involved in the development of agent-based models. And basically, six arguments uh, can, uh, are put forward. First, there is an increasing availability of micro-level data. 
second, uh, there is better storage capabilities and taken together, this will help uh, to uh, calibrate agent-based model. Third argument uh, raised notably by, by Tuel, there is the development of supercomputer in 2017. He told that right now there are computers that are able to simulate uh, the behavior of millions of, of, of agents in an in a fictive economy. Um, fourth argu uh, argument, there is um, a change slowly, but there is a change in the economy's curriculum so as to bring more uh, the computer programming skills. They are better software. And uh, this is a point almost always made when I interviewed um, people uh, from the DSG community. There is uh, progress in the capacity to focus. And usually they mention the work of Jacob Gardini here on the slide and Sylvain Baldain. So for all these reasons, I think that a broader use of agent-based model can be expected uh, at the BOE. Their fate is just more uncertain in the monetary policy area than in the financial stability area. Thank you. Sorry, we'll move on to the discussion, which is Domenico. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Roman, for the paper and the presentation. It was fun reading. Uh, and the ethnic connecting points, uh, where the points are bits and pieces of anecdotal evidence I actually witnessed, so to speak. Um, and so it was really, really illuminating. Uh, let me make two comments and one suggestion. The first comments is the first one is the following. Um, uh, if I remember well, indeed, the Bank of England was somehow leading the pack very well in advance with respect to the one bank research agenda um, in uh, uh, adopting uh, uh, heterogeneous agents, moderate agent based type. I do remember a paper by Mier, Jorun Mazer, and others, uh, and other economists at the Bank of England, which was a, uh, a sort of pioneering uh, rudimentary agent-based model of the interbank market. So these people, these bank, eco of economists, uh, bank of England economists were indeed working on agent-based model much before uh, Kearney came and uh, the One Bank Research Agenda was put on the table. Uh, this uh, allows me to go to the second uh, comment, which is the following. Indeed, uh, my impression that you actually are uh, corroborating is that uh, agent-based models at the Bank of England are models of uh, specific markets. Uh, we had a model of the interbank market. Then you were mentioning three agent-based models through different markets, the housing market, the cor corporate bond market, and foreign exchange market. The, the, the agent-based model which is missing there is a macro agent-based model. And the reason for this, in my opinion, is quite clear. Uh, Policy makers and central bankers are more open than academics to the agent-based approach. But uh, especially for those uh, areas of research in which that uh, uh, approach is more fruitful in terms of understanding the, uh, the working of the market and uh, maybe uh, assessing the effects of specific tools, policy tools concerning that market, for instance, the, the housing market in, in particular. What is, uh, when they are actually comparing, so to speak, the uh, pros and cons of DRG versus agent-based models in assessing the effects of monetary policy, then the weakness of the agent-based approach uh, becomes uh, important because exactly uh, the fact that agent-based models are black boxes is preventing the central bankers to understand what happens when the central bank is raising or lowering the interest rate. That's the point. While the answer of uh, such a question would be clear and neat in uh, the DHG model, you see what happens when you have monetary policy shock 
quite very easily. Uh, the same narrative, same type of narrative is lacking in uh, agent-based model. Then you can say, well, uh, you have a clear narrative, but it's clearly patently unrealistic, you know, because you have a departure from the steady state and then you go back uh, in due time to the steady state, which is not what happens out there. But narratives are very important. And this is something that one of the uh, leading figures at BOE that you interviewed was actually underlining, which was indeed exactly the impression that I had. Not having a clear narrative based on a neatly described uh, a transmission mechanism in your, your model is a, is a, is a uh, disadvantage for agent-based model. Uh, my impression is that uh, uh, the, in the agent-based community, we are moving towards a better, a better assessment of uh, uh, what happens uh, due to a shock. Uh, we may or may not use hybrid agent-based models. There are pros and cons of doing this, but also uh, we can move towards a uh, uh, macro-agent-based model, not hybrid agent-based model that are uh, indeed more focused. First thing. Second thing, we are developing estimation techniques uh, that may be uh, capable of giving us more power in... Uh, 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 forecasting. That's what uh, uh, what I'm doing with Jacob, and you were actually uh, quoting the paper by by Jacob Grazzini. And uh, there are other uh, other colleagues that are working on estimation of agent-based model and forecasting. So, if the agent-based community is capable of pushing forward the frontier research towards these uh, issues, estimation forecasting on one side and the uh, narratives for effects of shocks uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, the, op the, the road is open to uh, the acceptance of agent-based agent -based purpose also for macro purposes. The point is that, uh, of course, uh, they uh, can be somehow complementary or give a, a, a complementary uh, answer to the same research question uh, with respect to the edge models. You know, in uh, central banks are complicated institutions, and there are also uh, um, people are jealous of their area of research, and they don't want to be uh, somehow uh, they don't like interference. So one one reason for this segmentation between agent-based model for specific markets and the edgy model for macro research is maybe due also to this kind of uh, of, of this kind of problem. Anyway, I'm, I'm confident that uh, we are moving in the right direction, we as a com agent based community. And the um, suggestion that I have is that, well, you should go ahead. And uh, the, the Bank of England is the, uh, the, the best example of a central bank which is using these models, but they are used also in other central banks. Uh, I have uh, in mind the, ca the case of the Bundesbank, of the European Central Bank, and so on and so forth. So I think it's very rich. Very rich line of research, uh, if you go in this direction, and uh, that will there will be developments in the future. Romain, you want to respond? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Domenico. I'm going to start with your suggestion. Uh, I agree with you, as I mentioned in the, at the beginning of my presentation. There are several banks where agent-based models are developed, and, and uh, notably with Muriel Dalpont. Uh, we plan to work on the, on the deployment of agent-based modeling among different uh, central banks and policymaking institutions. So, in the in the future, we I will uh, I will start working on that. This is only the the first step of a, a bigger project, uh, I, I guess I would say. Now, uh, regarding your your first comment. You're right, uh, there, there is this paper in 2007, and there is also another paper by Kimo Soramaki and uh, uh, Galbiati in 2008 that also concerns the interbank market. And I mentioned uh, the, 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 the paper by Galbiati and Soramaki uh, uh, in the article. The reason why I don't focus much on this paper is because I have like, uh, like this historical question that is, why I have this impression that something happened between 2000 and, 2000 and 2016. So we have the impression that agent-based models 
took roots eventually at the Bank of England. And I try to understand why. And if I focus on this question, uh, this leads me to, to kind of put aside the earlier work on the agent-based models to focus mainly on, on what happened after the Financial Services Act passed and CARNES reform, because I do think that these are this played central role to the adoption, like the, 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 the adoption of agent maze model at uh, the Bank of, of uh, England. Um, regarding your second comment on the reason why uh, agent, there is no macro agent-based model, you're right, we, we share the same diagnosis and, and not only you, but uh, we can uh, more like uh, uh, several people express the problem in the same way. So I gave you uh, on my slide, uh, like uh, a quotation from Francesca Monti, but this is something that comes always also in discussion that I had with people from the Bank of England. There is a problem with the traceability and the, the fact that it's a black box is really a problem when you move to the uh, policy, uh, monetary policy uh, area. The other problem is also that is related to calibration. It's just that they cannot offer, they can, uh, like the problem is that they can match sty style as facts, but they don't really offer figures to, to, to a policy maker. And this is apparently what matters a lot, especially in the monetary policy um, area. And uh, regarding this situation, uh, economists from the Bank of England, like Alden and, and Turel has the same position as you. First, they say, okay, we don't need to pick a model. We can have both. So we need to work with the complementarity. And, uh, and, and the reason why it's important to work with complementarity is that maybe because uh, it's not really satisfactory to have only one model where we know that the, the main dynamic of the economy is driven by shocks. It would be great to have on the other side, a, a, a tool that is able to uh, account for endogenous fluctuation. Because as I said in the, uh, in the Oxford Economic uh, uh, Review that Muriel mentioned is, is that, well, uh, if you are able to understand the, the cause of the fluctuation, you are able to formulate good uh, policy uh, decision to fight against uh, them. And uh, starting from that, so there is the complementarity. So there is really not the idea to to, to, to take the lead within the VOE, there is just the idea to bring a new tool in the monetary policy area. This is the ambition of Alden and Turel. And the strategy for that is kind of close to yours. Uh, according to, to Turel, since the problem is the black box, well, let's build a, like a rather small model where it's possible to uh, identify how the, the, the transmission mechanism uh, work. Um, and, um, this is um, this is so. This is a strategy, and I realized while talking to this scholar from the Bank of Canada, I mentioned while uh, discussing uh, Muriel's paper that there is also inside the Bank of Canada a strategy that consists in building hybrid model just like yours. So, so, so people from the agent-based community try to uh, bring their tools by uh, making strategies to interact with the DSG uh, communities. That's, that's, uh, that's true. Thank you again, uh, Domenico, for your comments. My pleasure. Good. We had one question in the Q&A here. Um, you know, sort of it's, will the BOE consider working with wider ABM community um, in the UK and globally with researchers who can address some of the constraints? Um, especially on improving model validation. I don't know if that's answerable, but I'll let you sort of address it. Um, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, who has this question? I'm sorry. This and was... Uh, Jackie. G. Jackie? G, okay. The last question. Ah, uh, okay. Thanks, uh, Muriel. So yes, they are working uh, with, uh, like, the, the Bank of England is working uh, together, notably with the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and uh, especially with one person in the new Institute for New Economic Thinking, with uh, a Doin Farmer. So yes, the, the Bank of England is working with a broader community 
uh, with agent-based models. So I think, you know, we're just about perfectly on time. If any of the, uh, the people, the presenters sort of want to make one final comment, we'll leave it there. Um, other than that, you know, sort of I'd like to thank you very much. So any final comments starting with Muriel? Uh, can I add something about the question raised by Beatrice? To, sure. Yes, um, okay, just quickly, I think they more or less answer to your question, Beatrice, but the fact is that uh, how the question was how to reconcile uh, Roman's story and my story showing a limited uh, dialogue between the two communities. Uh, first, as like you show at the end with the development of this work at the Central Bank of Canada, I think you are right, part of this discussion are more easy in the uh, area, uh, in the, um, be in the, sorry, in the context of, so of central banks. I think the discussion are much more open in this area than in pure academic area. But then the main point is that what Romain show is that it is micro agent based model which are integrated in the central bank not a macro agent based and macro agent based people have much more reluctance there is the aggregation problem in between much more with different markets and coordinate and so on so i think it's much more complex and uh, it is the problem i had also sometimes uh, when we try to make quantitative assessment is that in the literature in the american economic review for instance you have some agent based model but not macro agent based model. The only paper which referred to macro agent based model was published in 2008, and one of the co authors is the chair of that session. So there are not many papers on macro agent based model, much more reluctance. So the point is that they are not exactly macro. You want to add something, Roma? Yeah, I would just say mm -hmm. that if yeah. there is a discussion, it's big also because in central banks, people are more pragmatic, they need to yeah. solve issues. And because they need to solve issues, they cannot have like uh, this uh, querelle de chapelle. <laughs> uh, they cannot fight uh, because uh, they don't believe necessarily uh, in in the, the methodology of the other. Just like you 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 feed money to the 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 policy uh, making process with a bunch of different approach, and 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 you see what you can take from that. Monica, any final comments? Oh, well, my, the other panelists have said everything that I wanted to add. So I think uh, uh, I just want to thank you all for inviting me and the chairman for his kindness and, uh, uh, and chairmanship, of course. I was just a figurehead here. It's Muriel who I think did much of the organization. No, no, you are a source of inspiration. Yeah, David. yeah. <laughs> but I think thank you very you much. Should, you should not play the, the, the underdog. Uh, good. We managed to stay on time, so I thank you all. Um, there are some Q and A sort of questions. If some were answered, you can look through. If anybody wants to correspond, I'm sure we're open to sort of a wide discussion on this. So the okay. idea is really to sort of present people. Here's where we are. It's a really useful research program that has a number of dimensions, and more people should be considering it. I think. So thank you all Thanks. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Bye.